I do try to imagine certain musicians, certain colleagues playing particular works. Um, if I uh, have a Brahms viola quintet, I know that particular quintet has some very substantial viola solos. And uh, I want to try to imagine, for instance, how would Cindy Phelps play that? Or how would uh, another violist uh, play that? And I try to mix the ensemble accordingly. Like, yeah, I want, you know, again, the same Brahms quintet has a really huge cello solo at the beginning. And then I want a really strong cellist with a huge sound. And I, I go and look for a colleague who I believe can deliver that. Uh, but. Um, but sometimes it's also based on availability of these musicians. Um, but I have basically the artistic goal of achieving the best performance in mind when I set out to find all these musicians to play any particular piece. I know most of them personally. Uh, a few have come via recommendations of colleagues. This year we had the Swedish pianist Peter Jablonski, uh, although I've heard of his name. And, and his excellent reputation, but it was uh, the cellist Ralph Kirschbaum who recommended Peter to me. And so since they were finishing up a U.S. tour, uh, they could both stay and come to La Jolla. And so I was very happy to, to make that happen. And uh, of course, composers. Uh, sometimes I, I, I don't know the composers personally, but we just have to be brave enough to approach a composer and say, hey, here is what we do. Could you please write a piece for us? Within Summerfest and its 17 some programs, um, there are some linkage among uh, evolving around certain themes. We have you know, three concerts devoted to the music of Brahms and the music of Brahms' friends. Um, and, and elsewhere, we have inserted very quietly Brahms' works. Um, so that's one mini theme that runs through the festival. At the same time, we have uh, a, a Russian uh, theme that appears in three different programs. Feltzman played Schnitke and Mozorsky, and we had Lila Josefowicz play the music of Prokofiev, Shostakovich, and Stravinsky. And, uh, and finally, in all chamber music program, we had the music of Taneyev, Prokofiev, and Rimsky-Korsakov. So that was a sort of a, it was an interesting byproduct. We did not set out to have a Russian theme. But the, that just evolved very naturally and by absolute chance. So I was very happy with that. But I, I don't think we have these mini themes now. We don't, we don't try to go for an overall uh, theme because we have too many concerts. We have, you know, out of 17 programs, it's very hard to have an overall theme. But however, in the future, when we do observe um, anniversaries of composers, we're, we're going to thread them through the festival. Uh, we wanted Sarayaho to write something. And Kaya Sarayaho is a very established composer. Um, and her schedule is such that she could only write a 10 minute long piece. Um, so we wanted to add more meat to the, uh, to the structure of that, that new music program. So we began to consider a younger composer, one that perhaps is not yet fully recognized, but really deserves um, our help and uh, our publicity. And Juan Ro was brought up. Um, first of all, I've, uh, he's written a violin concerto for me. Um, and he also wrote a cello concerto recently, which I heard. And it's a really beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and I know Juan Ro is very engaging a person. He's a very uh, lively person. And I think he would find the combination of cello, percussion, and piano very, very interesting. So I asked him. And so uh, he agreed, so Juan Ro became the second composer on that program after Kaya Sarayaho. Steve Mackey came to Summerfest in 2001, and we did, I think, two or three works of his then, and two of which involved Steve playing the electric guitar with the Borromeo Quartet. I know some of the more conservative patrons in the audience were a little shocked by anything resembling electronic stuff on stage. And there was a huge array of you know, speakers and whatnot, and the, the, the pedals for Steve. But I was thoroughly enthralled by, by Steve's work. Um, and I've been actually 
trying to figure out how to get Steve back ever since 2001. So when this viola piece, Groundswell, was uh, talked about, uh, although we did not participate in the commission process, but they, uh, Steve and the violist, Sing Ming Huang, were both looking for a chance to present the work on the West Coast for the first time. I, I jumped at the opportunity. I, I thought this would be a great venue because we could provide the backup ensemble of string quartet, piano, plus oboe, and uh, clarinet, bass clarinet. Um, so I thought, you know, this, we have the infrastructure to present that. And the new, the new music concert, the commission concert, would have been a perfect place to, uh, to include Mackie. Um, and, and, and Steve's such a nice guy. Uh, he's so down to earth. He's um, very engaging and, and very self-effacing. Um, and I just find his whole overall personality so, uh, so refreshing. In the 19th century, percussion instruments were used very sparingly, you know, 18th century occasionally. Um, but something happened, you know, starting with the Rite of Spring, you know, and that just enlarged the scope. And of course, Schoenberg's Guri leader and, and various Mahler symphonies, and it just enlarged the scope greater and greater. And now we have just percussion only pieces. And, and you know, who would have thought even, you know, 100 years ago that would have been possible? With Chris Rouse, he, he, his motto is louder and faster. And uh, with these two percussion works, uh, I know he wants, you know, in his own words, cataclysmic sounds. So I was talking to Justin, who played uh, one of the uh, percussion stations, and, and he was in charge of hitting the tam-tam. And I, I told him at the end of the performance, I said, Justin, you know, the, 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 the only thing that I had wished for was knowing Chris Rouse that you would have really hit the tam tam as hard as possible, and and he had a chuckle. We all had a chuckle because uh, the piece itself was already so loud that if he had really smacked that tam tam, I think uh, people might have found their hearing going slightly astray afterward. <laughs> now to talk about the program, um, Mussorgsky was my wish because with. With this Wednesday evenings, I wanted to have the headline, headline musician to play something they would normally do in a recital. So it's a combination of chamber music with recital repertoire. And I, I know um, Vladimir played Mussorgsky really brilliantly. So he readily agreed. As it turns out, you know, he's playing Mussorgsky uh, around this time anyway. So it's in his fingers. Um, and he had asked to play, he, he, he had submitted a few pieces that he wanted to play, uh, including Shostakovich's cello sonata. However, uh, among them was Schnitke Quintet, and that caught my eye, because I thought, you know, it's a piece we've only done once here, I think, in Summerfest, and that's a few years ago, but it's time for a new visit to that piece. Um, and Feltzman was very happy with that choice. But then, why well, do we open the piece? He just cannot walk on stage and start the Schnecke Quintet. And he said, how about a Mozart piece, a sonata? Because he said when he grew up in Moscow, Shostakovich always opened his concerts with a Mozart sonata or something to do with uh, Mozart. And so I thought, wonderful. Maybe David Chan can play a Mozart sonata with you. That's how the program came about. We have volumes of works and, and, you know, violent and disgusted reactions to new music when these works were first performed, ranging from Beethoven's symphonies, Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, um, Mahler's symphonies, and, and the list goes on and on. And, and, and now people can't get enough of these works. Um, I cannot defend any position of pro programming because there's nothing to defend. You know, the festival or any festival's job is to present a very, not only, uh, only a range of great works, but also works that deserve to be heard, um, played by the best musicians possible. And, and so the, all, all we can do is present our case in the best light and ask the audience to decide for themselves. They can go home and they can say, eh, Schnitke, 
I'll never want to hear that again. That's fine. You know, I'm sure Mr. Shinitki would have accept, accepted that position. And then others might say, wow, I never knew Shinitki's music before. This is fascinating. I'd like to hear something more of his. And of course, there are other works of Shnitkis that are perfectly accessible. You know, some violin music that he wrote, you start laughing because it sounds like quasi-baroque music. That's why he wrote. I mean, there was a little mockery in this, but this piano quintet of Shnitkis is very serious. It's a memorial to his, to his mother. And, and, and there's a lot of angst in that piece. But then if you're willing to bear with the piece through all those tone clusters, and sort of this buzzing sound that the string players make by the tone clusters. And then suddenly at the end, he clears the air with a beautiful C-sharp major chord. And at that moment, you know, if journey from the beginning up to that point near the end, and suddenly you go, oh my God, the clouds have parted. You know, the sun is setting. And you can almost, I mean, if you want to be a romantic, you can say, well, maybe that's the moment he sees his mother you know, and her spirit floating away into paradise because finally it's bliss and it just fades into nothing. I found that a beautiful image what Shniki created. But you have to journey through, you know, purgatory to get there. You know, you just, it's not a, a, from the beginning, it's not beautiful. And nor is it meant to be beautiful. And so, so I find that, you know, as a musician, um, to appreciate a piece, it takes some thinking once in a while, you know. And if you just stick to Brahms and Beethoven and stuff, um, it just won't work. I mean, I, I, I love this quote from uh, Frederick the Great, who was a great patron of the arts, and he composed himself, played the flute, and he hired one of the sons of Bach to be his court composer. And he wrote later in his life, he said, I cannot stand the cacophony and the noise of, of some of this music being written. It's just terrible. And he was referring to Haydn. <laughs> you know, go figure. I've been wanting to um, put the Rite of Spring into Summerfest programs for I don't know how many years. Um, but I just knew that the, the piece is incredibly difficult to put together and it will require a lot of rehearsing. And, you know, in a summer festival situation, it's not always ideal for m being able to put two artists together and say, okay, you have five days, and uh, this is all you do. So when Shai and Orion already played the piece somewhere else, and I was told about it, and I checked with them to see if they still keep that piece in their active repertoire, and when they said yes, I jumped at the opportunity to program this. I invited them right away to play it. Um, and I, I, I can't say enough about what they did in, on, at the concert. It was a, a, a fantastic performance, um, especially knowing how difficult it is to bring out all these lines and to play so precisely and to get this sort of, you know, animal-like primitive rhythm but it's unbelievably sophisticated rhythm, uh, but just meant to sound, you know, absolutely wild. And and they and they did it all. I heard Chanson Medicas um, in a festival in Europe, and Barbara Hendricks sang, and I was uh, I, I was I, I just couldn't believe it was Ravel, because the music is so sparse and so the harmony was so dissonant. It was none of this lushness you associate with Ravel's music, Daphne's and Chloe, or Shaharazad for that matter, the other song cycle on the program. Um, and I, I thought initially it was meant for soprano because Barbara Hendricks is a soprano, but I later found out that it's actually written for mezzo. So I started to look for a connection between Shaharazad and Chanson Medicas, because the same singer can sing both. And I asked my friend Ken Noda if there, there's a, a mezzo that can sing both, and he said, um, Tamara Mumford is the one. And so I asked um, Tamara uh, Otami, um, and she, as you can tell from the, um, uh, 
performance as she's very pregnant. You know, she's only a month or so from the due date, and this will be her last performances before she goes into sort of the bed rest mode. Um, but uh, but I was so delighted that she was able to sing both. Um, I just find Chanson Medica's a totally different look. I mean, again, in a festival situation, you want to present different faces of composers. And, and you can do a very lush work like the string quartet we did earlier in the festival and Shahrazad. And then you have something very severe and almost slightly primitive sounding in Chanson Medica's. And I thought that would be also a very good way to segue into the Rite of Spring. Lay Beethoven, you know, defies any sort of categorization. Um, and, you know, whether you try to think, okay, if Lay Beethoven, is, was he a revolutionary? Or was this revolutionary phase over, you know, starting the Eroica Symphony or ending with the Ninth Symphony? Um, I'm not sure. That's not for me to decide. Um, but I know as a, as, as a programmer for a concert, that the fact that you know you have something very bombastic and and driven like the Rite of Spring, Beethoven Opus 135 being one of the most heartfelt, genial, and gentle of Beethoven's last quartets, uh, I thought would serve as a good contrast, because you don't want the same piece, same type of music throughout, um, so you might not want to have another percussive piece. I mean, you, you would not put Rite of Spring in the same performance as Bartok's Sonata for two pianos and percussion. That's too much of the same. So yet, you know, in the end, when I was in the audience listening to this concert, watching the performers, I thought that Beethoven Opus 135 was a perfect foil for the Rite of Spring that will come after. Um, even though Opus 135 is a standalone masterpiece. Um, but in the festival, why not mix all sorts of masterpieces together? In, in every piece we play, you know, we all strive for something exquisite within the performance, whether it's exquisitely beautiful or exquisitely powerful. But the audience at the, at, at the end of the festival, for those who are diehards and who might not, I mean, might not be tired at the end of 17 performances, they might not remember these exquisite moments, and nor should they. But the idea is that something good, something positive, something they can remember as a good experience, you know, in the concerts. I mean, these so these are, are small details that gradually, as they accumulate in size and, and length, you can start to step back and watch the entire festival unfold from a, uh, from further away. And, and that's what I hope the accumulative experience would be for my audience. Um, and of course, those who want to really fuss about every detail, they're welcome to do that too, you know. And, and you mentioned early on about audience comments about Schnitke, you know. We're, we're, now, we're not out to please everybody, um, nor should we. But the idea is that we want to please everybody possible. I want, I want everybody to find not only pieces beautiful, but sometimes they need to be stimulating. Uh, and so it's not every piece is not necessarily beautiful. And we try to, try to explain some certain works to the audience. And you know, some people don't appreciate the comments. Some people find it very helpful. You know, again, the idea is not to, uh, not to not to be the most popular thing in the world, but it's to do the best thing we can.